So this is FRQ number 16, and this one is a, is a poison-based one, uh, and it goes through the different types of solids. So this question is going to go through and have you analyze, you know, basically what will be the difference between a molecular and an ionic compound, uh, and then it adds in covalent network later in the problem. So it goes through just various points. So the beginning part, it gives you a list of three chemicals, and it says you have a white powder and you don't know what it is. And it's either arsenic oxide, arsenic trioxide, diarsenic trioxide, whatever you would want to call it. And then it has a lead 2 chloride. And it has a mercury 2 chloride. Okay. So the first one says which of those would be molecular uh, and identify it. And that would be the arsenic compound. Okay. Now, really, that usually would be tough to gauge based on just giving you a list of chemicals because electronegativity differences are not 100% accurate. But given the fact that we have lead chloride and mercury chloride, which are two common precipitates in the AP exam, I think it's safe to assume that those would both be ionic compounds, at which point we're drawn to something that has a metalloid or a nonmetal paired up with a nonmetal, uh, and that's going to indicate that that's molecular. So arsenic oxide would be my choice for that. And then it says, how can the melting point confirm or deny that that's what's present? So you have a pile of white powder, and it's one of these three things, and you want to know which one it is. So if you tried to melt it, what they're really getting at there is that for a molecular compound, that the molecular compound is a molecule, or a set of molecules, that are being held together by intermolecular forces. And so for this one, it would be a combination of dispersion forces and dipole, uh, and, and that's easier to break than something like a bond. And so in this, what you would want to say is you want to say that the molecular compound is going to melt at a lower temperature, being held together only by those intermolecular forces. But then you also want to follow it up and then compare it to what the other two options are. Both of the other two options are both ionic compounds. So in an ionic compound, you have this giant chain of different ions being held together by those electric, electrostatic forces between them. And that ionic bond is going to be much stronger than the intermolecular forces are. And so that would give you a high melting point, uh, and so you would expect the molecular compound to be lower than that point. Okay. Part B gets into then what are some ways that this might be able to be able to conduct electricity. So when you're talking conduction on the AP exam, you want to bring up two pieces. You want to show that you know what the charged particles are, And then secondly, you want to show that they're able to move, that they're mobile. So this says, aside from the molecular compound in part one, the other two compounds, when would they be able to conduct electricity? So there are a bunch of different answers you can get here, but the most common one is probably going to be when they're aqueous, when they're dissolved in water. And so then you want to go through and say, if you had an aqueous solution, how would that fit this criteria? Um, the other one that's going to come up fairly quickly for most people is liquid. In the gaseous state, these would also conduct electricity. Uh, but if we pick a couple, in the aqueous, what you have is you have these ions breaking apart where they're interacting with the water molecules and they're in a fluid, so that allows them to flow throughout the fluid. So you have that mobility of a charged particle. The important thing to state though is that you want to be very specific that you want to talk that the charged particle is the ion. So in this case, in the case of lead chloride, you have a Pb2 plus and, and Cl minus ions in that solution. And it's not the electron. So I've even had students who have written, you know, that the, that the different ionic compounds break apart into ions and that the ions allow the electrons to flow. There is no flow of electrons across a solution. Any charged particle, any charge moving through space is a current. And so, so ionic compounds, whether they're in the aqueous state or if they're in the liquid state, when the ionic bond has been disrupted to the point where they can move around, it's going to be the actual ions moving back and forth. That's your current. Okay? If you have a metal, then you're looking at electrons moving across it, and it's typical electricity. Um, the other thing that's important on this is because it says what are some typical conditions, I think it would be wise to pick at least two to put down. So I would have said that it's aqueous form, it would conduct electricity, in the liquid form or the molten form, that those salts would conduct electricity because they would produce ions that are able to move. So they have a charged particle and they fit the criteria for being able to move. If I just had the solid form, I would have charged particles, but they would be locked into place and they would not have that mobility. Okay, so from there, it says that this white powder has been constrained into a vial that's made out of quartz.
And so now we're going to sit there and we're going to talk about you know, network covalent compounds. It says that this quartz, this SiO2, has an incredibly high melting point, which is indicative that it's a network covalent compound. And the question states, or asks, why is that melting point so high compared to a molecular compound like the arsenic oxide? Right. So for this, the key idea is that this is a network covalent compound, but you don't just want to label it and then move on with your life. You want to stress that you understand one thing specifically. And that is, in your network covalent bond, you have a chain or a series of covalent bonds. Everything is covalently bonded. So you don't have molecules covalently bonded and then intermolecular forces between them. The molecules that you think of are covalently bonded to other molecules, giving you a giant chain where really you have one molecule, of course. So the silicon bonds to, to different oxygens in a ratio of 2 to 1, but your entire quartz is all connected via covalent bonds. So if you want to melt that, you have to break those apart. And I can't stress to you that when you're grading a question like this, how hard it is to tell if somebody understands that point. A lot of people will sit there and say, oh, it's a never covalent compound, and they'll recognize that, and they'll have seen that phrase before. But then they'll say things like, it has stronger bonds. It does not have stronger bonds, or it might, but I don't know. But, but the key idea is not that it has stronger bonds, but that the covalent bonds that are in it are what must be broken in order to melt this. The other thing that's important in a question like this is if they ask you to compare it, talk about the thing you're asked to compare it to. So a molecular compound, on the other hand, molecular compound has these covalent bonds, but they're within the molecule, and then the molecules are held together. And when you melt it, that's what you're breaking apart. So in this, you're disrupting intermolecular forces, which are significantly weaker than a covalent bond. A covalent bond is about as strong as you can get. So the intermolecular forces that are between the molecules is totally different than the covalent bonds that are in the midst of this network covalent compound. And again, you really want to be specific on your answer so it's very clear. If you want to draw a picture, you know, or compare it to something like diamond, where you have a whole chain of carbon atoms all bonded to everything, um, that would be good at that point. The last question says, okay, let's say you did this experiment and you eliminated the arsenic oxide as a choice. Now you have the final two things. What could you do to determine which one it is? There are about 97 answers to this. So if you picked one, you were probably correct. Uh, but what's important is, is that you actually describe what you would do in the lab. So some of the answers I've seen have been to add the sulfate ion, which would then precipitate with the lead, uh, but now with the mercury, uh, according to solubility rules. I don't know what the actual KSP values of those are. I haven't looked them up. But if someone wrote that to me, I would rather want them to say, that when they mix this with a lead solution, they would see a precipitate, and when they mix it with the mercury, they would not, and that's going to be the distinguishing factor. Um, other things, iodide would be a good choice, because iodide with the lead would give you that really characteristic yellow color. Um, and then other things that can be as simple as looking at a melting point analysis. Okay, If you melt the compound, but then you want to be specific. What would you next do? So if you melted your unknown, you would then also want to melt lead chloride and mercury chloride and compare the melting points to those two. Um, there are wrong answers in this. The couple that I saw, uh, some of them were about stoichiometry, saying you would see how much of it would take to react. And the problem with that is you really don't know how many moles you have or your concentration or anything that could tip you off into, you know, you get 8 grams of product, well, so what? You know, or how do you know that you have excess or different things like that? Um, and then the other one that came up the most was the flame testing. Okay, so again, if you're going to write down flame test, that's fine. But then you want to be specific. I would take a known lead chloride and put it into the flame and see the color. And then I would put a known mercury chloride into the flame and see the color. And then I would put my unknown in and compare it to the two. The other thing you would want to mention, though, with the flame test is that's a pretty, pretty dangerous set of compounds you would be then volatilizing right next to your face. So you would want to mention, of course, that you would want to try and isolate any, any mercury salts flying through the air towards your, towards your eyeballs, uh, or towards your lungs, probably worse than that. Um, and so you would want to talk about some, figuring out some way to isolate yourself with some kind of shield or protection or, or something along those lines so that you don't die. Okay? So that was FRQ number 16. Um, a, lot of, a lot of good questions in there. A lot of people had a hard time with a lot of them. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to post and I'll try and answer them.
And if you haven't checked yet, there's a link at the bottom of this to the, to the whole sets of questions, um, as well as other answers if you want to look at some other topics.